The sermon text this morning is from Isaiah in the 53rd chapter. I'll be reading just the first few verses. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 3. Let us listen for God's word to us today. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, Holy Spirit, pour your breath, your wind, your dynamism, and your energy upon us this day that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we usually hear scriptures from Isaiah at festive moments in worship, at festivals of the church year. Advent, in the weeks before Christmas, Lent, as we prepare for Holy Week and Easter. Isaiah 53 is most often heard in the days each year when we remember Christ's suffering and death. And indeed, in this passage, the servant called the suffering servant by biblical scholars. This servant is noted for how he is despised and rejected, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and someone who is held of no account. That is, someone who is not counted as valuable, valid, respectable, worthy, or meriting respect or repute. So it isn't Advent, and we are not yet preparing for Christmas, although if you go into local emporiums here in our fair city, you might be confused about whether we are getting ready for Halloween or Christmas. And it surely isn't Lent, and we're not preparing for Easter. No, it's Children's Sabbath. And we are reading this passage today because we are talking about children. To be a child is to be vulnerable. The essential quality of children of childhood is risk. Children are at risk from the minute they are born. Their very existence is at risk until they gain enough strength, enough voice, enough agency to produce to begin to protect themselves. Until then, they rely on others, adults, people older and bigger and stronger than themselves to provide what they need to protect them from the risk in which they live. Children are born having to rely on others, which puts them essentially and completely at risk. Children have what they have, particularly when they are very small, only if others choose. To have a voice, only if people older than you choose to give you one. To have a home, food, health care, education, safety, citizenship, identity, self-esteem. All of these and more are available to children only at someone else's choice. Children are at risk of being held to be of no account, to be people of suffering, to be those who are despised and rejected, and to be those who are not heard when they call. So the question for us is, can we hear them? You might have been confused that maybe we were talking about Christmas because the sermon title was, Do You Hear What I Hear? But the question for us today is, can we hear the children in our midst. 
To hear them, we have to open our ears to some uncomfortable truths, some of which have already been shared. Research reported in January of this year by the Southern Education Foundation showed that while income inequality in our nation has been on the rise for many years, 2015 is a watershed. Because now for the first time, more than half of school children in the U.S. are live in low-income families. Most of these children have parents who work. Children under 18 make up 23% of the population, but fully a third of the U.S. population who live in poverty. And poverty makes for many problems. It isn't just a, a matter of not having as much money as other people. It's not that poor people just have less money and rich people have more money. It has all kinds of comprehensive and holistic impacts. Poverty is linked with substandard housing, homelessness, inadequate nutrition, food insecurity, inadequate childcare, lack of access to health care, unsafe neighborhoods, and under-resourced schools. Children living in poor families are at greater risk of many health problems that often lead to other problems later in life. From low birth weight to poor nutrition, which is manifested in, the, in many ways, inadequate food can lead to food insecurity and hunger, but lack of access to healthy food can lead to overweight kids and obesity. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to drive through a poor neighborhood in a city, and if you see children, they look like they're overweight. And that can give us the sense, oh, they're getting too much to eat. That's actually my problem. That might be your problem. The problem for children is that they are eating the wrong foods. And they're eating those wrong foods because they don't have access to the right kinds of foods. Poor children and teens are at greater risk for several negative outcomes, such as poor academic achievement, school dropout, abuse and neglect, behavioral and socio-emotional problems, and developmental delays. And these effects are compounded by barriers children and their families encounter when trying to access health care. Some would suggest that we can't afford to make this different. We, are can't, we can't afford to change this situation. We don't have enough money. And the question economists would ask is, can we afford not to change this situation? Economists estimate that child poverty costs the U.S. economy an estimated $500 billion a year in reduced productivity and economic output and raises crime and increases health expenditures. Now children, even those who are poor, and maybe especially those who are poor, are loved by God. Can I get an amen? amen. And so they are gifted by God with something that is given to them that should protect them. They are cute, right? I watched you. You all smiled when those children came up here. They're darn cute, aren't they? They are attractive to us. It's built into us that we look at them and think, my goodness, they're cute. This is God's way of protecting them. Because sometimes they can be awful to live with. <laughs> so it's good, it's good that they're cute, right? Their appearance and way of being are compelling to us. All the maternal and paternal spirit within us is drawn to the cuteness, the attractiveness, of children. You would think, therefore, it'd be hard to legislate against the needs of the cute, against the needs of the children. You might imagine that if children and their welfare is concerned, 
there'd be no question as to where our priorities are. And you would be wrong. We live in a polarized climate where you are either right or wrong, in or out, for us or against us. And children whose essential quality is risk, children can fall victim to a political worldview that is based on the goal of winning. And if not winning, if you can't win, the goal is to make absolutely sure that no one else, lo no one else wins. The other side is going to lose. The first priority for many poor families is securing food. SNAP is a program of the federal government. It's part of the Farm Bill. I used to live in Kansas. Bob Dole is, is Kansas's favorite son. Um, Bob Dole is known, he's beloved in Kansas, and he was one of the people who worked each year to make the Farm Bill a non-controversial issue. It helped farmers, that, that is to say it helped rural communities, and it helped poor families in urban communities. So it should be nonpartisan, right? No. The 2014 Farm Bill, which includes SNAP, which we know as food stamps, included an $8.6 billion cut in SNAP. WIC, Women, Infants, and Children, was also cut for fiscal year 2015 by almost $100 million. When our Ella came to us as a very fragile child, we had WIC. We were granted WIC. WIC is what makes fragile children's lives continue. And we cut it in this year by $100 million. These cuts have had a direct influence on the lives of children in our nation. Now, my friends, I've shared a lot of bad news. And something happens to our ears when we hear a lot of bad news. You know what happens to our ears when we hear a lot of bad news? We put our fingers in our ears. Um, do you know what it means when somebody says la 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 la? Okay. We stop listening, right? When we hear a lot of bad news. We get saturated, satiated, full to overflowing, and we cannot listen anymore. So how can we keep listening? Are children important enough to us that we can force our ears to stay open. Do you hear what I hear? Do we all, can we all hear the cries of the innocent among us? The song of the suffering servant which we read and heard before has been understood since the earliest days of the Jesus movement as a passage that prefigures and premeditates the Christ event, which is a $64,000 way of saying that this, although this passage was written not 2,000 years ago, but much earlier than that, long before the birth of Jesus, yet since the very earliest days of the church, the book of Isaiah has been seen and understood as referring to Jesus. The suffering servant is Jesus to the faithful, those who follow Jesus, and through him comes salvation. Salvation can come to us through children as well. Through our service to and attending to and protecting and preserving the lives, the health, the welfare and happiness of the children in our midst. In the Good News Bible study today, we will talk about grace, how hard it is to receive grace, how very hard it is to extend grace to other people. Do children deserve grace? Do people who have done nothing, honestly, children do nothing to deserve favor? They have not earned a single penny. 
They have not accomplished anything but making messes. They produce nothing but fatigue in their parents. Do they merit attention? Do they count? Let's turn that question on its head. Do we count to God? Do we deserve God's favor? In the face of what God is and who God is and what God has done, have we done anything, friends? What have we accomplished in the face of who God is? And yet, God accords us grace. Here's the good news, friends. You can start listening now. God accords us grace. Amazing, substantial, saving grace. The God who sent the suffering servant Jesus among us gives us saving grace through that suffering one. We are heard by God when we cry out. So can we turn around and hear the cries of those who need our care? Do you hear what I hear? Do we hear the cries of children in need in our families, in our communities, in our state, in our nation, and in our world? And if we hear, can we afford them and can we accord them sufficient grace to respond. May God give us grace that we may hear and we may act. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.